so cool. This is so cool. How many brain scientists have the opportunity to study their own brain from the inside out? And then it crosses my mind. But I'm a very busy woman. I don't have time for a stroke. It's like, okay, I can't stop the stroke from happening, so I'll do this for a week or two, and then I'll get back to my routine. Okay, so I got to call help. I got to call work. I couldn't remember the number at work. So I remembered in my office I had a business card with my number on it. So I go into my business room, and I pull out a three-inch stack of business cards, and I'm looking at the card on top. And even though I could see clearly in my mind's eye what my business card looked like, I couldn't tell if this was my card or not, because all I could see were pixels. And the pixels of the words blended with the pixels of the background and the pixels of the symbols, and I just couldn't tell. And then I would wait for what I call a wave of clarity. And in that moment, I would be able to reattach to normal reality. And I could tell, that's not the card, that's not the card, that's not the card. It took me 45 minutes to get one inch down inside of that stack of cards. In the meantime, for 45 minutes, the hemorrhage is getting bigger in my left hemisphere. I do not understand numbers. I do not understand a telephone, but it's the only plan I have. So I take the phone pad and I put it right here. I take the business card, I put it right here, and I'm matching the shape of the squiggles on the card to the shape of the squiggles on the phone pad. But then I would drift back out into La La Land and not remember if when I come back if I'd already dialed those numbers. So I had to wield my paralyzed arm like a stump and cover the numbers as I went along and pushed them so that as I would come back to normal reality, I'd be able to tell, yes, I've already dialed that number. Eventually, the whole number gets dialed. And I'm listening to the phone, and my colleague picks up the phone, and he says to me, (laughs) And I think to myself, oh my gosh, he sounds like a golden retriever. (laughs) And so I say to him, clear in my mind, I say to him, this is Jill, I need help. And what comes out of my voice is, And I think, oh my gosh, I sound like a golden retriever. So I couldn't know, I didn't know that I couldn't speak or understand language until I tried. So he recognizes that I need help, and he, and he gets me help. And a little while later, I'm, I'm riding in an ambulance from one hospital across Boston to Mass General Hospital. And I curl up into a little fetal ball. And just like a balloon with the last, last, bit of air just just right out of the balloon. I just felt my energy lift and just I felt my spirit surrender. And in that moment I knew that I was no longer the choreographer of my life and either the doctors rescue my body and give me a second chance at life or this was perhaps my moment of transition. When I woke later that afternoon, I was shocked to discover that I was still alive. When I felt my spirit surrender, I said goodbye to my life, and my mind was now suspended between two very opposite planes of reality. Stimulation coming in through my sensory systems felt like pure pain. Light burned my brain like wildfire, and sounds were so loud and chaotic that I could not pick a voice out from the background noise, and I just wanted to escape because I could not identify the position of my body in space. I felt enormous and expansive, like a genie just liberated from her bottle. And my spirit soared free like a great whale gliding through a sea of silent euphoria. Nirvana. I found nirvana. And I remember thinking there's no way I would ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. But then I realized, but I'm still alive. I'm still alive, and I have found nirvana. And, and if I have found nirvana, and I'm still alive, then everyone who is alive can find nirvana. 
And I pictured a world filled with beautiful, peaceful, compassionate, loving people who knew that they could come to this space at any time and that they could purposely choose to step to the right of their left hemispheres and find this peace. And then I realized what a tremendous gift this experience could be. What, what a stroke of insight this could be to how we live our lives. And it motivated me to recover. Two and a half weeks after the hemorrhage, the surgeons went in and they removed a blood clot the size of a golf ball that was pushing on my language centers. Here I am with my mama, who's a true angel in my life. It took me eight years to completely recover. So who are we? We are the life force power of the universe with manual dexterity and two cognitive minds. And we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. Right here, right now, I can step into the consciousness of my right hemisphere where we are. I am the life force power of the universe. I am the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses that make up my form. At one with all that is. Or I can choose to step into the consciousness of my left hemisphere where I become a single individual, a solid, separate from the flow, Separate from you. I am Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, intellectual, neuroanatomist. These are the we inside of me. Which would you choose? Which do you choose? And when? I believe that the more time we spend choosing to run the deep inner peace circuitry of our right hemispheres, the more peace we will project into the world, and the more peaceful our planet will be. And I thought that was an idea worth spreading. <laughs>